I'm very honored and excited to bring on the show my first guest of 2022. And this guest is someone I've admired and respected for quite a while, and I'm very interested and excited to speak with her tonight. She is Vivian Zhao, or Vivian Zhou. I'll ask her how I should pronounce her name a little bit better. She is an accent coach, an accent coach. Working with people's accents is her specialty. And there are people in the world who consider this something of a controversial profession. So I'm really excited to talk ab about this with her and clarify what she does and how she can help people. I've gotten to know her a little bit and I have a great deal of admiration for the work she does. And I really want to share her uh, experiences and her insights with you because I don't like people being judged unfairly. I don't like bullies. So I'm really uh, looking forward to clearing up some of the mysteries around her profession and also just share someone who does really great work with you. So without delay, I'd like to introduce you to Ms. Vivian Zhao. Hi, Vivian. Hi, everybody. Hi. Thank you for having me here. Oh, thank you very much for joining me. How are you? I'm well. I'm well. Thank you. How are you? I'm well. I'm much better now that you're here with me. Ah, uh, that's sweet. That is sweet. So Vivian, thank you. where are you? Oh, you're welcome. I, you're very welcome. I, I'm in Montreal. I'm in Canada. It's a little late here. Okay. Um, what uh, what time is it? Right? Okay, 10 30. Well, I appreciate yeah. you. I appreciate you uh, staying up late to join the show. Um, um, actually, some of our viewers, especially those viewers in South America, for them, it's even later in the evening. So I appreciate ah. all of you joining the show late. Yeah, you're uh, popular. Well, I don't know if I'm popular, but people seem <laughs> to like the show. That's Vivian, great. I'm really excited to have you on the show and share your work and your experience with our viewers because we have viewers from all over the world. Uh, we've got people tonight from Pakistan, from Brazil, uh, from nice. Mexico. It's really exciting. Now, let's start from the beginning. Let's go back in time. Can you just tell me a little bit about your background, how and where you grew up, and your educational background, a little bit of your life journey? Yes, absolutely. And my my last name, I heard you saying my last name. It's it's a hard one. I am I'm Chinese. So my, um, so I speak Mandarin and, uh, oh, bonjour. Somebody say, <laughs> saying bonjour, Vivienne, in, in French. Uh, yes, I speak French too, because I'm, in, I'm, I'm in, in Montreal. And uh, I was born and raised in, in China, but I left at a very young age and I lived in California for a few years. And then I lived in England for a few years before uh, settling um, permanently in Canada. And I've been Canada, I've, I've been in Canada for over thirty years now. So I'm much more Canadian than anything else, even though I kind sure. of I lived around the world. And uh, so my native language is actually um, Mandarin. Okay. Well, actually, so I... it's it's. Shanghainese. It's uh, Shanghainese, which is uh, a language a that we different. Yeah, it's actually very different. It's a whole yeah. separate language. And uh, how do I pronounce your name? My last name is actually yeah, your family. Cho. Cho. Yeah. Okay. It's pronounced Cho in 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 Mandarin, but it's yeah. not a a, spe a a phoneme, a sound that exists in English. So yes. I usually just take off um, the H as if, you know, it, it doesn't exist. And I will introduce myself as Vivian Zhao, ju just to make it easier, sure. you know, to pronounce. Yeah. Well, but, I, uh, I like to pronounce your real name. They usually, usually introduce themselves either as Zhao or sometimes they, they even just uh, use the CH instead of the ZH. Yeah. It yeah. does sound so, more Chow. like... Okay, so you grew up in various places, but you settled yes. in Canada. So yes. I under, So I assume that you went to like high school in Canada. High school, no, England. 
Ah, England for high school. And then you came to Canada. Yeah. And Got it. yeah, Canada after, after high school. So, uh, yeah, I, um, I actually, I don't know anybody from, and the, did anybody in the audience go to, uh, like, uh, the British school system? I'm I know some sure, people like, let's probably see. not. Yeah. Okay. Cause you, maybe if you had gone to like, uh, an international school, you know, some right. of them use the British system anyway. So mm -hmm. I have the GCSEs and that's very uh, okay. And uh, yeah. And my professional background is a speech language pathologist. Does anybody know word... what that is? Let's see. You can type it in chat. What's a speech language pathologist? What is a speech language mm -hmm. pathologist? So Vivian, where did you go to school after high school? You finished high school. What, what yeah, happened? I went to I went to McGill, which is a university in Montreal, Canada, mm -hmm. where I live today. So, yes, I work with British. Ah, there you go. So, you know, the British system. So yeah. I did my GCSEs in, in, in London and, okay. uh, and I even did one year of A-levels in England okay. before coming here. I, I did my bachelor's and my master's degree in speech language pathology at uh, mm -hmm. McGill University in Montreal. Good. And McGill is uh, a very, very uh, uh, renowned university uh, in Canada and the world. So it must have been a very yes. interesting education. Yeah. And somebody asked, and a voice coach? Uh, yes. Well, we do do voice. As a speech language pathologist, I'll just give you a little bit of a background. Yeah. Uh, we have um, usually postgraduate degrees in communication sciences and disorders. Okay. So we are basically experts in anything to do with communication, uh, either verbal or nonverbal. Um, I usually ask people whether they've seen um, the movie King's Speech. Anybody saw King's Speech? Yes. King's Speech. No. Yeah, the movie. So in so the he movie, had a speech if, in movie. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. SLPs are required to study anatomy and physiology. Yes, we do study anatomy and physiology and neurology of yep. uh, the speech production system. And um, so in the movie, there was a speech language pathologist that helped King George of England to overcome his stutter. And that was a true story. And, uh, and that person, he was uh, um, a real person in history and actually one of the pioneers of our field. He was a speech language pathologist or a speech therapist in French. I said, in French, it's an octophonist. And I think in Spanish, octophonista, I'm not so sure. And uh, yeah, so uh, some of us work with stutterers, some others work with uh, kids with aut autism, some others, you know, Down syndrome, others yeah, still work with the elderly population, people who have um, had a stroke or Parkinson's. And yeah. yes, some of us specialize in voice. So people who have dysphonia, um, voice disorders, vocal nodules, that's also speech language pathology, uh, even like laryngectomy patients um, that goes yep. under speech language pathology as well. And my area of expertise is in accent modification, which yep. is kind of different because it's really not, it's, it's, it's obviously not a disorder, but uh, it's a difference, right? So, yeah. So, well, what's, what's really interesting there is the connection between um, yeah, speech guess. pathology with speech pathology, there's really a physiological component to it, right? There's something happening. An extreme example is a stroke person who's mm -hmm. lost mobility inside of their face. There's a physiological component that you have to work around, right? Mm -hmm. and, yes. And it strikes me, and we'll get to this eventually, but with accents, it's not that they're imp impeded by physiology, but they've spent no. their life using muscles in a different way. In their yes. language, right? And so, also, um, you know, when we, uh, we, as babies, when we're born, we're born with the ability to tell the difference between all speech sounds in this yeah. world. 
Okay, babies can do that. And uh, but very quickly over the first year of our lives, we start to um, go through this process called perceptual narrowing. So we start to only pay attention to the speech sounds that happen in our right. environment. And the rest, we kind of start ignoring. So very fast within the first year, we start to really pay less and less attention to speech sounds that don't occur around us. And mm -hmm. uh, eventually we actually lose the ability to distinguish between yeah. um, each sound differences that are not important to us. Right. So one good example is, uh, for instance, uh, the short and long E and I in English. For yeah. a lot of languages, there is no such distinction. So right. it could be quite challenging for some non-native speakers to um, at first tell the difference between the, these two vowels. You know, do I live here or do I leave here? I don't know. You know, yeah. it's like, I they're, have to say they're it not again. They're conditioned actually over time since their childhood, they're conditioned not to be able to recognize it. So they may not even hear it. It's like when you're exactly. not familiar with something, if you're not expecting exactly. to see something, you probably won't see it, even though it's right in front of you. So exactly. part of that is that um, conditioning. Many. Yes, definitely. Um, you, uh, your, your, your child, actually, we are we are born to learn language we are we we i don't i don't I, i'm not i'm kind of an atheist but uh, so i don't believe in god creating us this way but we are actually um made to learn language yes and, and um so little kids learn languages really really fast yeah. right really fast you you don't you don't need to do anything and they just learn yeah. just like that and uh, so if you expose your child to um, different languages they then they will grow up speaking these languages or at least comprehend these languages yeah they yeah can identify so them they, they can will, distinguish them exactly and they will be able to retain uh, the yeah. ability to tell these sounds apart. Obviously, it depends on which languages you expose your child to. But all, but but definitely, the more um, the more your child is exposed to different languages, the more uh, able mm -hmm. he or she will be able to uh, learn languages early uh, later on. Obviously, they won't. Would, uh, they won't. Um, they won't lose that ability. It'll keep their perception yeah, wide it, rather than narrow, right? Yeah, exactly. Wider. I think that I think that's an important thing, Vivian, because a lot of people think wrongly that if a child grows up into a in a household with two languages working, that they're not going to learn this or that one correctly or well oh, enough. No. But I think it's totally the opposite. <laughs> oh, it's the it, opposite. It's going to increase their yeah. Exactly. Exactly. At yeah. first compared to a monolingual child, they may be a slightly delayed, okay? Yeah. If, you, if you compare a multilingual child and a monolingual child and uh, at the same age, uh, you would think that maybe the, the, the multilingual child is a little bit behind, you know, they, yeah. they are, but really that behind is just because they're, they're learning so many languages. So, yeah. you know, a one, one word like book, they, they may have to learn another word, leap in French, and then yeah. they may have to learn a third word for the same object, shu in yeah. Chinese, you know? So they just have more to learn, but eventually, usually around five, six, seven years of age, they should be yeah. right there with their peers. So all their languages should be at the same level as their peers who only speak one language. So yeah, the more the merrier. Don't be afraid so, to expose your kids to different languages. Sure. So Vivian, you were working, you studied and you worked in speech pathology, but then at some point you made a move into something we call accent coaching or accent reduction or accent modification work. How did you uh, make that transition? Well, um, it wasn't such a transition in that uh, I, was, um, I was doing both. 
Yeah. Mm. And, um, and uh, uh, I started a private practice in speech therapy a uh, long time ago. It was uh, more than 20 years ago. And uh, one, one year I was uh, on vacation in, in California, in San Francisco, and there was a, um, a workshop on accent modification uh, vaccine reduction for speech language pathologists that was going on at the same time, same place, you know, and, uh, and I was curious because that was like 20 years ago and uh, it was an, it was a very young field back yeah. then. And even now it's quite young. So sure. I was very curious. And um, so I attended the workshop and said, wow, this is really interesting. And uh, I loved it because I love languages. I speak different languages and uh, it really, it really, it, it fascinated me. So I started incorporating that into my nice. private practice. And, uh, and uh, after a few clients, I realized that this is my preferred clientele, actually. Nice. I, I love it. I love working with accent clients. Yeah. Now, there's a, lot, there's a lot to get to here, and I want to just sort of break it down step by step. A lot of our, our viewers are um, around the world with different levels of English, so I want to make sure we articulate this nice and clearly. Let's start from the uh -huh. sort of the, the basic part of it. Define accent for us. What is an accent? What is an well, accent? There are um, many definitions of accent. If you, if, you, if you Google that online, there is actually a spectrum of, um, of, uh, of definitions. There are some okay. very narrow definitions and there are some very wide definitions. So um, one of the examples of a narrow definition is that somebody will say uh, an accent is um, uh, 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 speech sound features that um, that define somebody as a non-native speaker of the language. Okay. So according to this type of definitions, uh, people who are native speakers don't have an accent and people who are non-native speakers, they have an accent. While some mm. other definitions are much wider and they see accent as um, features of uh, your, um, your speech uh, production that yeah. tells people, that defines where, tells people where yeah. you're from, geographically the, and sometimes sociologically as well, right? Socioeconomically. Yeah, that, that first definition seems really problematically narrow because, for example, yes. if I'm a native English speaker, and you compare the way I speak or sound with somebody mm -hmm. from Florida. Yeah. Yes, we're both native English speakers, but it's quite evident that we're going to sound very differently. Exactly. Right? exactly. So how does that definition so, account for it? So we have to widen the that, definition, don't we? Exactly. So I like the wide definition yeah, where basically too. it says that everybody has an accent and uh, yeah. an accent just tells people where you're from. That's yeah. it. And uh, so native speakers have native accents and non-native speakers have non-native accents, right? So in, in that definition, everybody has an accent. And I yeah. think that is absolutely true. Everybody yeah. has an accent. And, and there's uh, nothing wrong with that. Exactly. So right? there, it, it says everybody has an accent. There is no right or wrong accent. Right? So in my example, no my my native English is equally as legitimate as the person from Florida who talks like that exactly. or the person from the UK who talks like this. We all have an accent yeah. and they're all equally Ac legitimate, right? There are like hundreds of English accents all yeah. over the world, you know? So it's uh, and, to say that yeah. this is right and that is, uh, well, this is an accent and that is not is just... Yeah. It, that's just ridiculous. You know? Well, I think that there's but, what you're touching on is a little bit of that. Maybe we'll talk, we'll talk about this eventually, but maybe some of the problem with this arises from a previous era when it was considered that the UK English was the standard. So mm, it, yeah. was, it, was, it was not an accent. Like RP from UK, the, the received pronunciation was the standard. Everyone else had an accent, including us Canadians. But exactly. I think we've moved past that era. That's a, that's a previous era. 
Yeah, it's I, uh, an accent is always what somebody else has. <laughs> yeah, that's a, exactly. Right? That's what somebody else has. And uh, and, and by the and way, it's not just English, right? It's all languages. Yes, all languages, all languages, and there is a like a hierarchy of uh, of accents in a particular language. I don't know what type of uh, languages are um, spoken in the audience, uh, we have, but like we have a lot. We have Spanish, we have Belgian, Dutch, French. Okay. We have okay. Uh, well, Portuguese. French definitely. You know, like I, I'm from Quebec and our French accent is not, eh, it's not considered too great. <laughs> and By I who? Know, I know. And, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of equivalent to almost like Southern United States accent right. of American accent, right? There's, a, there's an implication of socioeconomic hierarchy, right? Yes, and it's not it's not even related to all socioeconomic. It's really just the related geographically, but there yeah. is there is a hierarchy and yeah. like it or not, English it's as perceived. well. You know, if you yeah. yes, in, if you lived in the UK, you know the Queen's English is go oh nice and posh. But if you had a Cockney accent and you work as a lawyer, for instance, yeah, yeah. chances are you're gonna change that accent. But well, we live in a different less. world. Those are really old ideas. Like, for example, the Queen of England may speak elegant RP, you know, Oxford style English. But one of my favorite British human beings is the actor Ray Winston. And he speaks South London Cockney. And he's probably a very rich guy. So which of those British people do I respect and admire more? The actor Ray Winston. I love that guy. The Queen, I could take or leave. So in our era of more, the, our era of equality, that we're striving for equality, those older status symbols that are related to accent no longer really hold, hold weight yeah. for us, right? Yeah, yeah. But unfortunately, it's, 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 it's reality. It is yeah. like that. I'm looking it's at the perceived, the it's the perception of region. people, right? Yeah. And I was uh, just chatting with um, uh, uh, an, Eng um, an English teacher um, uh, in Italy. And I asked her, you know, you know being in Italy, probably it, it, since it's closer to England than to North America, they will probably want to learn the British accent, right? And, and they say, ah, oh, yeah, may, um, they, they, they usually people just want to learn more of a standard accent, but probably people from Milan, for instance, will want a British accent to sound more posh. So yeah. even to them, like, you know, they, um, they, they would prefer people who are higher, let's say higher in social class will prefer the British accent because yeah. it's, it's considered classier. Yeah, and I think, I think this is part of our problem in the world is we, we have these signals, signifiers of perceived status, but somebody can have perfect British high status English and be poor or even yeah. worse, be a total jerk. So yeah, it doesn't necessarily yeah. make you posh. Yeah. Absolutely not. Absolutely. I mean, it's very, Donald Trump it's sounds like an common. idiot, but he's wealthy. Let's not go there. <laughs> I mean, talk about, you know, people that uh, we think of in the U.S. Anybody in the U.S. could be wealthy and worthy of our respect, regardless of their accent. <clears throat> the accent doesn't mean the same things as... Um... So go back to your definition, that wider definition <laughs> of accent relating to region, rather than the status things that are, that are associated with those regions seems to me more realistic because depending on where you learn that language, what immersion environment mm -hmm. you're in, you will adopt a certain different sound, I think. For example, I grew up in Toronto. Really? And when I moved to mm -hmm. Vancouver on the West Coast almost 30 years ago, I couldn't believe the way people spoke out here. They sounded really odd to me. The, the, the <laughs> accent on the West Coast sounded really striking to me. However, by now, I probably have that same accent. I don't know. Uh, no, I wouldn't 
wouldn't I wouldn't say so, but it's uh, you know it's it's very unfortunate that uh, accent has such a dividing um, dividing force. Yeah. Shall I say? Yeah. And uh, I just shall we? Well, if accent if accent is related to region, this is mm -hmm. where some of the prejudice comes from because in the past. Some regions were poor, some regions were wealthy, some regions had political power, some regions did not. So if your accent indicated the region and environment you're from, it did have mm -hmm. some kind of indicator. It was an indicator of your socioeconomic status. Yeah, of, your, of your status. Absolutely. Yeah, I don't think that's true anymore. I don't think that's true it's socioeconomically. Not, it's not so, exactly. It's not so, uh, so dividing anymore. Yeah. But, you're but right. the prejudice it's, remains. Yes, the prejudice remains. And part of the reason is also because uh, accents are actually extremely salient. It, um, it doesn't, uh, it, 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 takes, um, it takes as little as 30 seconds of speech for somebody to notice an accent yeah. and immediately form some type of opinion Uh, yes. about that person based on the accent and this is this is shown over and over again in studies yeah I, yeah you so know I, it, I find the same thing I can tell I, it's sort of a game you play like you can hear someone's English a native speaker's English for example from the UK I try to imagine I know what region of the UK they're from or Canada mm -hmm. uh, because yeah. it does it does it is salient it is re, it is distinct right? yeah Vivian I want to move to another question Yes. Um, I want to ask about your clients. Yes. Uh, let me just. Oh, see somebody question. said speak Taiwanese Mandarin. Yes. <laughs> Funny looks. It's that is very true because you know what I I'm I'm from mainland right I'm from mainland China and um, and when I hear uh, Mandarin from 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 people from Taiwan, um, yeah. I have to get used. To, I have to concentrate on it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I have to concentrate. If I don't concentrate, I actually don't understand that um, that much. But my Mandarin is not not that great. It's my French is better than my Mandarin, unfortunately. Yeah. So I want to ask you uh, kind of two questions in one. Why does someone seek a change in their accent, and who does this? Who are your clients? Who comes to you for help? Uh, my clients. They mm -hmm. come from all walks of life um mm -hmm. but i would say if i if i could generalize um they usually come from more of um uh professional background that um uh, professions that 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 talk a lot <laughs> so engineers for instance i have a lot of engineers lawyers I have a lot of lawyers, um, some uh, um, some people in the medical profession. So people that who really need to talk for for their jobs, and they right. uh, and they and they work in English, obviously. And uh, I also have uh, quite a bit of clients who are um, kind of just in the business world, and. Um, And, uh, and, and, and they need to, you know, do presentations and deal yeah. with clients and everything. Um, so more professional world and business world. Right. Yeah. And what Although is, I when, they, other as well. when they come to you, imagine I'm a client coming to you and I say, Vivian, help me, help me. And you say, okay, great. What is the problem I'm describing to you? What, what is my problem that I need help mm -hmm. from you? I'm well, speaking usually, English. I, I have a job. Yeah. What's, usually, what is my problem? They tell me that they're um, they're tired of repeating themselves. They don't, they 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 don't they feel embarrassed when they say something, and it's obvious that um, that the person didn't understand. Um, I I just wrote a post on uh, LinkedIn about mm -hmm. uh, talking on the phone, and that that is a very common complaint amongst yeah. my clients that they're not well understood right. on the phone. There's no body language. There's no lip movement. Yeah, and they they it gives them anxiety. 
just uh, be, you know, having to talk on the phone and uh, especially at work. And, and I, I've even had clients that tell me that even, even when, you know, order pizza, I don't like it. I, I get my husband to do it, you know? Yeah. So, so the, yeah. the core of the, so the core of the problem about, that you go ahead. Uh, it's more about being understood by others yeah. and also uh, about uh, confidence as well. They want to so, feel confident when they speak yes. in English. So we, we've understood, we've, un we've defined accent as being an indicator of the region where your English was learned or used mostly. Mm -hmm. And the problem that you help solve for these clients is comprehensibility. People do not understand mm -hmm. what they say when they say it. And what we're talking about is really, we're talking about the way they say a word or the mm -hmm. way they say and pronounce a it's sentence. A word, right? a phrase, uh, you know, because Accent is not just pronunciation. Accent right. is also uh, intonation, stress pattern. And in English, we have you know syllabic stress, phrasal stress, yeah. word stress. We can we have all kinds of stress patterns. And all of the uh, yeah. sound qualities. Uh, so it, yeah, and the, the the pitch changes. The uh, mm -hmm. you know so it's it, all of that actually plays uh, in the accent as a and those as you said in the beginning, those things, those sonic elements, right? Pitch, tones, stresses, pronunciation, those are not universal. All of our languages do not, not necessarily all. share those sounds. So not if they all. have, yeah, very if, unique. If, if they've narrowed those sounds, like you, you described earlier in childhood, if they've narrowed out those sounds and they're not able to produce them, that is mm -hmm. going to affect their comprehensibility to, to others, right? Yes, absolutely. Um, the, um, there is a Mandarin speaker here, so she, she, she can relate to this. Mandarin, for instance, is a tonal language, right? Yeah. We have different tones. And the same word, the same consonant and vowel spoken in different tones will mean different things. And yeah. these tones don't exist in many other languages, vast majority yeah. of the languages. So yeah. when, uh, when people learn Mandarin, the hardest part is the pronunciation because they, yeah. they, they can't tell the difference between the tones. Very yeah. few of them can. And a lot of them, they can say a sentence that are perfect consonant vowels, but because of their tones, I, I have no clue what they're saying, basically. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, and that's just because you know, it's hard to do these tones if you cannot even perceive the difference yeah, you in can't them. Hear them. Yeah, and once you have, um, once you can perceive the difference, then you can work on pr producing the difference. That's but right. even then, it becomes uh, it's difficult to start producing something that you uh, a sound um, or a pitch pattern or whatever it is that you're trying to learn that uh, that you did not acquire as a child. Because yeah. as I said, we lose a lot of abilities as we get old. <laughs> yeah. So this is really this is really fascinating to me, and it reminds me of a story I tell often. So forgive me, those of you who have heard this before, but apparently, uh, it's a bit of a historical legend now. But when Christopher Columbus came to the West Indies for the first time, he had three ships, right? The Santa Maria, the Pinta, and the something. And Columbus and his sailors parked, anchored their ships out in the ocean, right? And then they got in little boats and went ashore. You know, little rowboats. They went to shore. And then they met the indigenous peoples. And the indigenous peoples were shocked, right? Like, who are these people? Who are these weird-looking dudes on the, on the beach? And, you know, they, the first thing they want to understand is, did they come out of the ocean like fish? And then Columbus and his sailors said, no, no, we came from those ships. And they pointed to the three ships, big ships, out, on the, out in the ocean on the horizon. The natives looked out there, and they could see nothing. All they saw was ocean. Now, even though there were actually three ships on the horizon, the natives could not see them. Why? Because their brains had no reference of a ship. They'd never seen cloth, sailcloth. They'd never seen fabric because their culture never wove fabric. They'd never seen planked wood before. They had never seen anything on that ship. So their brains had nothing to refer to and recognize. 
So they looked out and the only thing they saw was ocean. So I think it's similar with perception. If as a yeah. child, your environment has excluded certain sounds, mm -hmm. your brain gets trained not to perceive them, right? Is, is that kind of accurate? Yeah. So it's not just yeah. the old, the old saying is seeing is believing. I actually think it's the other way around. What you believe is what you'll see. Is or what, what your you brain see. Is. That's really yeah. good. Yes. That's so a, if your brain a... sort of believes there's a certain range of sounds because that's your uh, language uh, sonic environment that you grew up in, it's... your brain sort of believes in those sounds. Those are the only ones you'll hear or produce. Mm -hmm. So yeah. So if that's how we start developing our accents. And then we get to a point where we've learned a second language and we're using it in our profession and nobody understands us. So we come to Vivian and say, Vivian, you got to help me. <laughs> no one at work understands me when I do presentations. I'm going to lose my job. And even if I don't lose my job, I'm definitely not going to get promoted. So help me. Mm -hmm. So my next question for you, Vivian, is how do you help yes. them? What is it that you do? How with do them? I? Okay. Well, um, Intervention always starts with a thorough assessment, right? In the assessment, uh, I would take into consideration of the person's needs and goals. So different people have different needs and different goals. Um, and uh, so um, that's, that's first and foremost. So for instance, I just, uh, today I, I, I started with a new client and, um, and she, she really wanted to learn the glottal stop. Okay. Which is really rare, um, for, for a T there are actually five T, five T sounds in English. I am sure, um, not many of you know that, but, um, when the T sound is before a nasal vowel we often change it in the in, in north american accent into a glottal stop so for instance we will say cotton and not cotton now we will say cotton we will say important and not important and that it's it's optional right? you can say important but you will hear a lot of native speakers say important and not important mm -hmm. Right, and a lot that of Canadians is a actually lot pronounce of, it with like a D sound. Important, the D sound is between two vowels. Two vowels, More right. between two vowels, yeah. Like so, like we ladder, say water, water, yeah. water instead of uh, uh, wa wa I can't even say wa water. <laughs> yeah. I can't even do it with the T. So yeah, or, so uh, the D is between two vowels. But if the T is before a nasal vowel, um, nasal vowels are all vowels that end with an N. So A-N, E-N, U-N, all of these are nasal vowels. And, um, and, uh, and that is often changed to a glottal stop. And right. I asked her, you know, um, you know, she didn't know it was called a glottal spot stop, but she said she wants to learn it. And I asked her why. And she, and she said, because I live uh, on, um, uh, in New York on Staten Island. Okay. Staten and Island. That Staten Island. And, and, and she says, when I say it, nobody understands where I'm from because I cannot say it like the natives can. She would say Staten Island. She's a Spanish mm -hmm. speaker. So I, I can't remember exactly how she say it, but she definitely does not do the glottal stop. So right. this is a very detail that it's, it's a detail that usually I don't go into. Usually I will do yeah. something, you know, I, I would, I will focus on what will make um, that person the most comprehensible um, in the fastest way. But right. individuals have individual um, needs. So for her, it's very important to be able to create, pronounce where she's where she lives correctly yeah. to native speakers in a way that native speakers can understand so for her that's important so great that's important for her we will be covering that so we always take into the needs and uh, into consideration needs and goals of the individual and then we do we do an assessment of uh, in words in sentences paragraphs uh, conversation is very exhaustive and we pinpoint all the differences 
basically of uh, the way that person produces certain sounds, uh, certain stress patterns, the phrasal patterns, connected speech, because we don't usually say words separately, we link words together, right? The linking pattern, all of those um, compromise, um, uh, can comprise the this huge entity called uh, yeah. called uh, called accent. So we we do all of that after the assessment. Then we can pinpoint which ones would be the most important to cover first because we want the most uh, change. Um, you know, right off the bat, the, the most bang for your buck, basically. And then we go um, into more details. So they're Design actually sort part. of, it does, and it, it kind of tells me that one of the goals that the person has is they want to sound more like the place they live in. Let's assume they live in a certain place, like Staten Island. Yes. They want they, so the ac the accent change they want is to fit that regional environment, right? Yeah, this uh, my new client. She just wants to be understood when when people right. ask her where do you live, and and when she answers. You know, a lot of times people don't understand what she's saying yeah. and, uh, and it's but important if she was, for her. So she's not like, she lives in Staten Island. She wants to sound like, she wants to be understood there. Yes. She's not interested in learning how a person at Oxford pronounces that word because they may sound, no. they may pronounce that T. They may say Staten. Yes, they will, Staten, produ right? yes, they will produce that T. They produce so she's that not trying to... Well. Right, the British tend to use yeah. T's. They say "wota," yes. unless they're from yeah. uh, somewhere where they say "woa." Yeah. So it's it, she's not trying to develop an accent according to a standard. She's uh, no. um, trying to develop a better accent according to where she lives. So it's purposeful. Is that correct? Yeah. I'm just looking at the the process sounds very rigorous, exhaustive. Is there a way to make it fun? Okay, it's actually not. <laughs> It's not rigorous or exhaustive. All it needs is really 15 minutes of practice per day. You know? It's just that you're, the, yeah, it sounds like you're that. rigorous in your approach. You're trying to identify I am. details. I yeah. am, yeah, but for the clients, not really. Usually people find it fun and 15 minutes per day is all you need to see a huge difference very fast. And when you said earlier, you said, um, we're gonna cover that glottal stop, for example. So you mm -hmm. identify it, you discuss it, and then do you practice it? Uh, like repet do oh, some yeah. repetition? Absolutely. Work? Yeah. We, will, we will start practicing and depending on the person's abilities, uh, oh. I can first go into perception or not, uh, um, depending on where, where exactly um, the ability breaks down, basically. Right. It can be at the perceptual level, it can be at the production level. If it's at the production level, which uh, is it at the word level or is it at the phrasal level, conversation level? So, so yeah, it sounds rigorous, but it's more rigorous for me. That the, the yeah. client kind of does what I ask them to do. And uh, right. if they do exactly what I ask them to do and practice 15 minutes per day, and that could be fun. That sounds like the fun part. They actually usually find it fun. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody has ever complained to me that uh, it was, um, it's like uh, too much or. Yeah. Now we have a, we have a viewer um, who is at On The Spot Language. He's a friend of mine. He's an educator in Toronto and he runs a program mm -hmm. called On The Spot Language. His name is Anish and he works almost exclusively with Japanese students. And what they do is they come to Canada. And he doesn't okay. operate. He doesn't operate in a classroom. What he does, is he takes them into the city, and he puts them in situations mm -hmm. where they have to use their language, English, to talk mm -hmm. to strangers. Mm -hmm. They talk to strangers, so he encourages them to develop the confidence to use their English in That's real situations. It's very experiential. Yeah. Um, and I, 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 I see there's some overlap in the work you do. So maybe the three of us can have a conversation someday in private. Yeah. Yeah, we should. I'm gonna. But he's got an interesting uh, question yes. here. Tips for L and R. Yes. Uh, you want a tip? Do we have time for a tip? We're kind of running sure. over your. It's yeah? okay. 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 So the tip I usually give um, uh, um, Asian speakers that can tell the difference between R and L is that uh, R for R, the tongue should not touch any part of your palate. Right. The okay, top so of your R, top no of touching. Your no touching. Yeah. So R. for them, 
they, it's like a collapse of the two sounds. They, they do something in between yeah. the two sounds, right? Yeah. So, uh, so for them, it's pretty much the same move, tongue movement, but it's not. Right. So for R, the tongue should not R. be touching the palate, R. while for the L, at least for the light L, there are actually two types of L's, light and dark L. For the light L, it should be touching the alveolar ridge, which is the junction between the upper front teeth and the palate. La, right. la, la. Now, in la. the word, in in the word like world, you say world. That is a world. that is a challenging word for a lot of people because you have the vocalic R. So any R that's after a vowel. We call it a vocalic R because they, they just function as vowels. They, they're no longer really consonants. They're vocalic R's. So you have the vocalic R, okay, which is actually, you know, it's, uh, it's actually more challenging usually than the R before vowels. And then you have the dark L, which is not a light L at all. <laughs> So forget about that tip about the tongue at the alveolar ridge because that's only for light L. So L's, um, there, there are two types of L's. I, I don't think we have time to get into this, but if you're interested, I don't know who's... Uh, if you're interested, we can talk about it uh, at another episode or privately. Yeah. Sure, I'll connect you guys. Um, okay. What I'd like to get to next, uh, Vivian... We'll talk to some of those questions in a minute. Rose. <laughs> um, so now we understand what accent is, where it comes from, how it develops, how you help your learners. I want to talk about something that really strikes me. Um, when I first saw a post you, you made on social media, I saw some interesting criticism of what you do. And it, that wasn't new to me. I've heard it elsewhere. I've heard people mm -hmm. take exception. I've heard people almost outraged or upset that you help people reduce, modify their accent. But before we get to the answer, for me, it doesn't sound like you're reducing their accent or even modifying it as much as developing their English accent. You're, you're moving in, to me, you're moving in the other direction. You're not reducing or modifying, you're enhancing and developing. Yeah. So what I, what I want to know is, I, what I, is... Why do people have a problem with accent reduction? Is it just a term that sounds problematic? I, I think the thing is that um, a lot of people, uh, they, they equate, um, the accent is being attached to their identity, right? And mm -hmm. they think that uh, by redu reducing or changing their accent, they, uh, people want to change or reduce their uh, their identity, which is not yeah. true because accent in accent modification, accent, accent training, accent reduction, what, however you call it, the key that what, what we aim is for your speech to be clear and to be natural. Because if you're not saying something in a way that, that is natural to the listener, they will first focus on how you said it before yeah. they focus on what you said. So you're losing right you're losing this uh, efficacy um, yeah, if, of the communication efficiency or efficacy or whatever the clarity of your speech yeah. is being affected by the naturalness as well right. so we want to be clear and we want to be natural and the yeah. accent modification part is really a byproduct right it's not what we yeah. focus on it is a byproduct just like uh, my new client who wanted to who just wants to be understood when she when she says where she lives you know yeah. so the the focus is not on how how she what kind of accent she she has but right. on how she can produce the sounds so yeah. that people understand her so it's like so, the uh, accent reduces inadvertently, in, indirectly, exactly. as a result of developing a more clear pronunciation and, and yeah. other, fe other features. Yeah. So, so I, uh, I don't see why it's taken so personally, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, Maybe but it's obviously. just a branding issue. Maybe it's just the word reduction sounds like... I think people associate it with things like controversial things like conversion therapy, where people are... Um, people who identify as uh, gay, or for example, they go to mm -hmm. parents might take them to conversion therapy and turn them into yeah. heterosexuals or something. Exactly. But, it's but not that's not like what's that. happening. We're 
we're not saying that there is a norm right yeah. we're not saying that's that right. there is a norm right. that we're trying to achieve we're not saying that there is a standard that we're trying to achieve no we're just right. saying that this person has some difficulties in in speech comprehensibility yeah. and we are going to help them to be more comprehensible and to be honest i do have clients that have very little accent and they yeah. you know quote unquote accent you you guys know what i mean yeah. like they they, they 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 their english is really good and they mm -hmm. speak um they their their accent is really quite there is no comprehensibility issue, but yeah. they still want to work on it. And I don't see why not. Like it's, yeah. it is their choice. Absolutely. You know, it's just like somebody, uh, you know, if uh, I don't have, I don't have plastic surgery, but I am getting older. Maybe one day I will have plastic surgery. So what? You're going to judge yeah. me for that? You know? Yeah. Is, is that changing my... your identity? Are you denying exactly. your identity? Is it changing my ident identity? Yeah. Like, do I, is it, you know, um, what I look less Asian just because right. I do whatever, you know, it doesn't, it's, it doesn't, to me, it's, it's that person's choice. It's his yeah. choice or her choice. It's a, to say that accent reduction or accent modification or accent training or accent, whatever is inappropriate is saying that the, um, that my clients don't have that freedom of choice to yeah. choose what they want for their lives to feel confident to yeah. feel whatever they want to feel that's it's, more of a uh, denial of their identity and their freedom than yeah. seeking a change in their accent i also think of exactly. it like this way vivian tell me if i'm wrong hmm? i always like to say i always like to reason this way i like to think so what's the alternative if the alternative is don't go to vivian just live in staten island for 20 years What's going to happen? Your accent's going to change anyway, right? Well, yes, uh, yeah. To you, some you degree, yeah. To some so, degree, maybe not. Uh, so if that uh, if that's the case, are we going to criticize all... that person exactly. because their accent changed naturally? Oh, you did something terrible to your identity. Of course, that's ridiculous. Exactly. It's just the degree, right? Their, their yeah. accent may not uh, will probably not change as much as uh, that's right. if they work. But, it, but the, the, it will still change somewhat. Yeah. Yeah. But the fact that Most another person is involved when they engage you, I think some people have a problem with that because it, 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 to them, it strikes them as this person is telling this person that their identity is no good or their, mm -hmm. their, their accent that represents their identity should be denied or repressed. That's not what you're doing at right. all because, in fact, they're coming to you for help and you're solving a problem for them and they have the exactly. freedom to do that. Yeah. So for me, the, the, really, the criticisms are absurd. There is no such thing as losing your accent. I see yeah. a, a comment there about uh, losing your accent, but there is no such thing as losing your accent. Huh? Yeah. So just to be clear, unless you uh, are immersed in your language before adolescence, it usually happens around adolescence, unless you were immersed in that language before adolescence, the likelihood of you losing your accent is extremely slim, yeah. extremely slim. Now you can work on it and you can, you can sound almost native. Uh, if you, if you, if you get training and everything, if you yeah. work with, uh, with, a, with, a, with, a, with a, an accent coach, like, uh, such as me. And, um, but unless, uh, you would only be able to achieve native native like accent if you were very talented mm -hmm. so it goes the, the 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 most important factor is actually age of immersion okay mm -hmm. and then the most important factor after age of immersion is talent and then it's practice so practice is really the only thing you can um you can play with yeah the rest so the variable that you can it's under it's not under your control and right. uh, and the likelihood that somebody who is immersed in the language after adolescence and lose quote unquote their accent is slim to none yeah and, so and this no idea of losing thing. their accent i'll give you an example yeah. that comes to my mind i have a very close friend i've known him for 30 years 
And when I met him, he had just immigrated from East Germany. So he had a strong German accent. And uh, he wasn't in a position to go to school. He had to work, so he worked. And he's been in Canada ever since. He's made his life here. He's got a successful business and family. Now, and I've known him all this time. I remember his accent because he was my close friend. We, I used to tease him and make jokes and we'd have fun with each other. And I remember how he sounded and I can compare it to how he sounds now. Now, most people don't realize he's an immigrant. His accent has changed a lot. Now, in mm -hmm. his first year in Canada, if he had, if he had told someone, oh, I need to go to an accent reduction coach, somebody might have been upset with him. Oh, that's, you're going to lose your Germanness. That's a denial of your identity. But now that he's been in here for 30 years, he, he never sought an accent coach or any kind of help. Mm -hmm. But he's a social guy and he just, you know, immersed. Mm -hmm. Now looking at it, he has, to some degree, changed his accent. Mm -hmm. And nobody's going to be upset that his accent has changed naturally. But they would have been they, upset if he had... Right? Yeah. No one, no one says, how so, dare you deny your Germanist? But here's the interesting thing for me. He can switch back to his 1991 accent. So it's oh, not yeah? lost. He uh, remembers well, how we used to sound. I think he does. This guy did not have the age of immersion, but he has not. Right. Yeah, I think he's got a natural that. linguistic ability, exactly. right? Exactly. A natural ability for it. A natural aptitude. So yeah. not everybody has this level of aptitude. Of course. But he, he's good. Yeah. But what I'm saying also is that um, even though now he sounds fairly close to a native speaker, if I ask him, okay, give me 1991, he can go right back to it. He can speak in his English with a strong East, East German accent. Uh -huh. um, like, it's not lost. It's in there somewhere. He just doesn't use it. Right. So, yeah. Like I said, he's, 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 he's talented. He's talented. He's talented. Most talented. people lose it to the extent that they forget how it sounded, right? That's well, what you mean they, when they say... You, usually, yeah, it will be difficult for them to imitate. Yeah. You know, there, there, there are people just who, are, who can just imi imitate, any, imitate any accent, right? That's right. Yeah. So, so some people are just talented. And, uh, and, and, and if you don't have that talent, well, it's, uh, that talent is actually rare. So your friend and is that's, actually rare. Yeah, and that, you know, we know comedians and actors who do funny imitations of famous people, right? They have mm, that kind of yeah. natural ability to imitate and mm -hmm. yeah. I, 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 but I think some people can do that, very, right? Yeah, but that's actually very uh, interesting. And because these people who can change their accents uh, to you know, like different regional accents and different non-native accents easily, they're usually native speakers of English. Right. If you, yeah. So let's say, you know, like uh, Leonardo DiCaprio, um, apparently he did, uh, he did the South African accents really, really well, right, but yeah. he is a native speaker, speaker of English and South Africa is, uh, is another native, um, English accent. And, uh, and, but if you take a non-native, uh, actor such as, uh, Antonio Banderas, you know, excellent yeah. actor, but he has an accent in English. Yeah. And he will never be able to do a South African accent. So right. there, there is something there. We're not exactly sure, um, you know, in terms of research and science and everything. We're not exactly sure the mechanics of it all. Yeah. But usually the ones that can modulate their accents really easily are the native speakers. So if you're a native right. speaker of French, you can probably, like, um, be able to to do different accents of French much more easily right. than any non-native speaker. There's You're a, probably yeah. able to recognize the nuances of those sounds, right? Perhaps, so here's an, yeah. Uh, here's and, a question and, from and, Chris. And Chris is in Belgium, so she speaks okay. uh, she speaks French, I believe, and Dutch. So right. How can, yeah. under, how can you understand someone who speaks English with a, a strong it's, it's Indian hard. accent? I actually, right now, I have. Uh, I have a, a client uh, who is Indian and uh, and she has her podcast and she wants uh, my help uh, with uh, with her with her English accent. It England it, it, Indian accents can be 
difficult to comprehend because of um, uh, mainly because of their intonation. Actually, they mm-hmm. have very they have a lot of pitch changes in one sentence, and sometimes within the same word, they will yeah. change their pitch a lot, which is not the the usual. Um, uh, intonation pattern of uh, of English, and uh, that coupled with uh, you know the difficulties with uh, between w and v and uh, yeah. tongue positioning for their t's added together, it can be it can be challenging, and they talk really fast. So how do you understand uh, an Indian host live streaming? Uh, unfortunately, you're just gonna have to get used to it. The more we get I, used, I to think that's it, part of more, it. Yeah, yeah, you just need to get used to it. You, if this is somebody who you know you you admire and would like to listen to all the time, then I suggest that you just expose yourself to a lot of Indian speakers and get used yeah. to their accent. There is no that, other way. I think that's something that people forget is that your exposure uh, develops familiarity with you. I, I give you a quick yes. little story that I often re- refer to with this. Um, I work with a student from uh, Brazil and that student came to Canada and they went to the airport and they got in a taxi to go downtown to their residence. They had just arrived in Canada, they got into a taxi. Uh, the next day at school, they described the taxi and the taxi driver to me. In Vancouver area, there's a lot of East Indian folks and they described this taxi driver and they described a very, very particular decoration on his, uh, on his uh, dashboard. And he said, oh, teacher, Paul, this taxi driver had such a strong accent. I couldn't understand a word he said. Okay. A few weeks later, this is a true story. I took a taxi from our train station to my home. I got into the taxi and I swear it was the same taxi driver. The, 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 the little doll that my student described to me was on the dashboard. And the person was identically described to my student. And he started talking to me, and, and he said the same kind of things to, to me that he said to the student. But I understood him, no problem. From my perspective, I would not describe him as having a strong accent. I didn't even think about it. So what's the mm-hmm. difference? If it's the same person, does he have a strong accent, like my student says? Or does he have a basically no accent, as I determine? Well, the difference is the, our familiarity. I've grown up listening to that accent, Mm -hmm. so it's familiar. So I didn't hear the accent as I understood his words. I caught his words. So that was really, that that really taught me that the listener is partially responsible for what we call accent. Is that is that accurate, Vivian? Is that is that? I'm not sure whether you're responsible for the accent, but well, I I mean, like the person. Let's say is important to you okay yeah. then uh then perhaps you should put in some effort into uh familiarizing yourself yes. with accents so for instance if you work with uh, a lot of east indians and uh and you often have difficulties you know with that accent then maybe you should familiarize yourself with yeah. it so um that is definitely something that uh, the listeners can do to um to to help the pronoun uh, the the communication because communication yeah. is not a one-way street it's that's what i was trying tr- to say yeah it's not that we're responsible for the accent but we're mutually responsible for the overall communication right it's exactly. it's both of our exactly. jobs yeah Oh, yes, you're not responsible for his accent, but you're responsible to keep this conversation going, to have yeah. uh, to, to, to have a successful communication. Yeah. So there are many things that you can do to have this successful um, communication. And uh, I, I'm, as a speech pathologist, I can give you many tips, uh, but it wouldn't, it wouldn't help you uh, with like live streaming. Yeah. <laughs> because that's not a conversation, it's just the monologue. So it yeah. wouldn't help uh, live streaming or, or um, podcast or whatnot. Yeah. Yeah. Um, wonderful, Vivian. Thank you for clearing up so many of these English mysteries no, and accent my mysteries. My pleasure. I'm just looking, I'm reading the, the comments and I don't want to yeah. uh, How practice English written. Okay. 
So he Zulkarnin, was, uh, my friend Zul Zulkarnin from Pakistan. Zulkarnin, mm -hmm. if you want help with your writing, I have a writing course for you. So I'll get in touch with you. Um, lots of great comments here and some questions uh, that I'm going to have to get to next week. Questions about other things, other topics. But we're going to have to wrap up, Vivian. So, right, yeah. Um, we're like we're way over your usual hour. Sorry. But uh, there's so much to talk about. I wonder if I could invite you back on another time. Would you come back? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. It's been Guys, you a want Vivian to come back and this, talk more about accents this was with us? This my first live session ever. So it's... Uh, well, it's yeah. You're a wonderful guest. Well, thank um, you. I, I, would, I would love to come back. Thank you for welcoming me and, uh, and making this uh, a, a great um, first experience for me. My pleasure, Vivian. It's wonderful to get to know you and learn about what you do and clear up some of the misconceptions about it. I'm a big fan of what you do, and I think it's important work. And I think um, the best thing we can do when we have these uh, misunderstandings about something is to clarify things. That That's communication. That's learning, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, absolutely. I mean, I know so many of my viewers every week ask questions about accents and pronunciation and all those issues. Mm -hmm. uh, so it is a it's a legitimate concern for language learners and and language users of all of all sorts. Um, yes. And I just think I'm just grateful there are people like you that are willing to be courageous in a in a in a field and help people because that ultimately that's what it comes down to. You're doing something that helps people a lot. Thank you. Um, and so are you. Well, I'm, I'm trying to do my share. Ah, oh, well, you're doing Here's a, a great suggestion. job. Okay. Monthly pronunciation, <laughs> pronunciation tips with Vivian. I'm not sure what I can do monthly because it's quite late here. Yeah. And, uh, and so unfortunately, um, it's, uh, it's, a bit <laughs> it's past yeah. my bedtime. <laughs> there was uh, um, somebody from Colombia said we were yeah. in the same time zone, right? It's, yeah, they're. Uh, I'm old. They're the same time I'm zones. Old. Yeah. I'm usually in bed by now. <laughs> but it would be my uh, pleasure to come back again and discuss. Uh, maybe uh, my friend Wai, my friend Waiha in Rose Korea Royce? is asking. Rose Royce. Sure it's means. a challenging. It's a challenging word. For, or are they asking uh, if you if you drive a Rolls Royce? I, I don't know. Do I drive? I, I drive an Audi. There you go. It's, <laughs> That's close. It's much easier to pronounce than Rolls Royce. So yeah. if you're gonna buy a car, buy buy an Audi. Yeah, then you you can you can pronounce your uh, to to the store That's when you ask for it. Very welcome. Very welcome. I'm 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 so glad that um, people found uh, this um, this session interesting and and helpful yes the yeah. rolls royce is, it's got the r and the l challenging yeah especially for exactly. someone uh, in korea yeah yeah L yes oh yeah. uh, we don't see it. <laughs> it's so nice. um vivian i'm gonna say goodbye to you now uh and wrap up the show Thank you very much for joining me here and thank you for helping my viewers get familiar with your work and um, your ideas and your um, approaches and the work you do and the, the way you help people. I think it's wonderful and I want to have you back soon. Uh, maybe thank after the, t the time changes and then this will be a more reasonable hour. Ah, that's true. But don't you have, uh, you don't have daylight saving? We will have we do. the daylight saving at the same time. No? Oh, that's yeah. right. Yeah. So it so, will always be a three hour time difference. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well. But it's okay. I, I, I will be happy to, um, to come okay. back again. And, uh, and next time you. I won't, I won't blah, blah, blah so much. That, uh, no, it's great. I mean, people need to know there's a lot to learn about what you do. Right. So maybe next time we could do a, like a workshop with someone. Sure. We, can invite, we can invite someone on screen with us. Who wants help with their accent? You can do that? Demonstrate that's it. That's awesome. Sure. Yeah, let's yeah. do that. Yeah. Okay. Let's do that. Let's uh, let's get together and plan for that. In the meantime, I'll say good night, okay. uh, and uh, I'm going to sweep you off screen. So everybody, say thank you to Vivian. Thank you, Vivian. Thank you.
Take care, everybody. Thank you. Hope to see you soon. Connect with me on LinkedIn. This is my LinkedIn, LinkedIn yes. kind of ad accent reduction. Reduction. Um, reduction. Yeah. Bye, and, um, everybody. By the way, I'll post this on my YouTube channel and in the description, I'll put all your links for everyone, okay? Okay, awesome. Okay. Thank you so Bye, much. Bye, Vivian. Paul. Thank you. Uh, and as for the rest of you guys, I'm going to finish up the show. Um, yeah, great. Lots of great suggestions here, guys. I'm glad you uh, appreciated uh, Vivian's insights. So thank you. Guys, I'm going to say good night. Uh, see you next week, next Friday. Uh, we'll just have a question and answer show, so um, there won't be a guest next week. I'll get to some of your questions. Thank you very much for joining me tonight. Thank you for welcoming Vivian. Thank you for allowing us to clarify some of the misconceptions about her work. I'm a big fan and admirer of her work, and I think it's important, and I think it's helpful. Guys, take care. I'll see you next week. And in the meantime, as always, stay cool.